That's great. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, Luke chapter 6, and kids can make their way to Children's Church. Luke 6 is where we'll all be as we're going through the apostles. And we're putting three together today. That's how well known they are, is that these poor three are going to be grouped together as one. It's kind of a good news, a uh, bad news to the, uh, to the whole story is... Um, Good news is they've been handpicked by Jesus to be one of the 12. Not bad, right? Pretty good. Bad news is they're not living long to talk about it. And then these poor guys will actually be like, well, at least we're going to be famous. Mm, you don't get that either. You're like one of those few that we really don't know much about. So we're talking about three today. Simon, Absolutely no idea how he died, very little about him. Really one word, zealot, Simon the zealot. Outside of that, don't know too much. Judas, it's Judas Thaddeus. He was martyred, but besides that, no one really knows much about him. There's one story, brief story about him. It was a question he asked. And then James... And you go, oh, yeah, brother of Jesus. No, not, not that one. Oh, like Peter James. Mm -mm, no, nope, nope. He's actually known as James the Less. How's that? Um, really, about all we know, except this is what church history out of all of these, you know, it's church history. It's uh, how true. Um, it is thought that he was thrown from the temple wall, stoned and bludgeoned with a club. Congratulations on being one of the 12. So that was a rough go. And outside of these names, very little is really known of them. Uh, I'm going to point out one theme, though, with these three. Kind of a running theme with them, with these three apostles, is they were very different. The little that we know, they're very different. And although they're nearly forgotten, their contributions were priceless. So we've been through the apostles this summer. Today are these three grouped together. Next week is Judas, the bad one. And then the service I can't wait for is the next week, which would be a Labor Day weekend, is uh, we're going to talk about the twelve. Overall, the 12, uh, Casey ordered for us a really nice, it'll be in all the bulletins, a beautiful, colorful of the Last Supper. So you can see the 12. And now that we've studied them, you can now look at that great painting and you'll see so much of what we talked about is in each of these characters. If you really knew the 12, you could point out which were which. In most cases, you could figure out who's who if you knew all that there was to know about them. And so we're going to do that on the, on the uh, first week of September, Labor Day weekend. If you're to miss a week, that's not the week to miss. Next week you can miss. If you get a good opportunity to go on a boat or something, yeah, next week's fine. Catch me online and give online. Ooh, almost forgot that part. Um, but, uh, but you're not going to want to miss uh, the first uh, weekend in, um, in September. That'll be a good one for us. You may not feel like you fit in a Christian mold. I think that happens to people when they drop into a church, especially an established church. They come in and they're like, uh, I'm not really like them. I'm different. Well, we send a false me message, which is, well, kind of get with it and conform to be like us. That's not the way it was. These 12 apostles were very, very different, and in their differences, they gave great contribution. So if you don't feel like you fit maybe a traditional Christian mold, I'd say, good, don't. They didn't all join together to conform into this, they're all the same. If you've watched in The Chosen, John, you're going through The Chosen, 9.30. Uh, it's for the student ministries. You guys watch an episode or a part of one? An excerpt. Because they're surprisingly very accurate, aren't they? 
given some of the personality, like today's, you imagine Simon the Zealot, which we're going to talk about, having to sit and eat fish with Matthew. These are two that you're not going to see together. They're not going to travel together, but there's something that brought them together, and that, of course, was their calling with Jesus. Heavenly Father, as we look into this passage, would you encourage us, maybe in our uniqueness, help us to be all the more content in our calling with you. Thank you for accepting us as we are, in Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bible there, Luke 6, and I'd encourage you to bring your Bible if you don't, or certainly grab it on your phone. It's one of the listing of the 12 apostles, uh, 14, actually down to 15. It says, now there's Matthew, Thomas, James the son of Alphys, which we'll see later is James the Less, and Simon, who was called the Zealot and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became the traitor. Simon called the zealot. That's about the only mention he gets. You imagine that you've made it to the elite 12 and you're barely referred to. This is it. And when you are, you're referred to as the zealot. Simon the zealot. Palestine of the day was ruled by Rome. Rome was in control. Then you had this group of people, the zealots. They were the top protectors of Jewish culture, nationality, distinctiveness. They're kind of like they're fervent patriots. They're uh, tea partiers of the past, or they're, they're, they're trumpers that are on the bridge with their flags, right? Some of you are going, yeah, that's me. Yeah, the zealot. You're the ones that are standing for, and you're standing. That's the zealot. They were so against Rome, they became very violent. They're actually, I read in one place where the zealots were were actually referred to as the earliest of terrorists. Not the time maybe of Simon, and not necessarily that Simon was, but he was a part of that crowd, that crowd that stood for Israel, for Judaism, like none other. Well, here's a story. You're familiar with it. Jerusalem was totally destroyed in AD 70, but there was a final remnant. They were zealots on the top of Masada in the southern part of Israel. King Herod had this, um, this palace built, overlooks the Dead Sea. How many of you have been there? Yeah, good for you, Pastor. Yep. It's nearly unbelievable, am I right? Like, how in the world did this happen? Well, this fantastic, this is the place, by the way, that we, we did you hike it at all? Did you hike up or down? Or did you do the gondola? Yeah. I don't think the gondola was there then. I, I, there's a chance that was added at a later date. And by the way, good choice. My last trip, I took them all to the windy snake path. And I'm like, okay, here we go. And it wasn't five minutes later, so I'm told. They're like, where'd the pastor go? I'm in the gondola. <laughs> we have a picture of Grant. <clears throat> it's the funniest picture. There's the big snaky path, and there's a crowd of maybe 25 that decided to go. I was one of them, so was Sarah. So was our son Grant with his blind cane leading the way. I'm like, okay, this has got to be one of the funniest pictures I'm going to take on this trip. And he's all bold with his cane making his way down with 25 people leading. They could have gone right into the Dead Sea, and nobody would have known It was very secluded, Masada, so these zealots went to the top of Masada. The Romans came. The siege was three years. They couldn't get to them. I mean, there's no way you can get to them. So for three or four years, the zealots are up there. 
not giving in, and many of you know the story, it probably took three, four, six months to build in just piles of rock to build a ramp up to the top. It's still there today. The ramp is still there. And finally, the Romans went to the top, and in Jonestown kind of style, they had all been killed. That's a zealot. The message was, there is no way they're going to conquer us. It's unbelievable the story on how heads of family had to kill their families and how it was organized and how they would all be found dead because they will not give up. That's the phrase. Until 1986, the military, actually, when you're commissioned into the military, you do the snake path at night to the top, and you do your oath of service to Israel on the top of Masada. Because the message is, we will not give up. Boy, is that not their spirit? I mean, if I know the don't mess with Texas is a popular phrase. I get that because they're crazy there. But it should say, don't mess with Israel. Am I right? I mean, their technology is more than you know it is. Their hands and their intelligence is more than you know it is, and they're not going to put up with it. They look back to Masada. They still look to Masada. Don't give up. Don't give up. They will not conquer us. We will go down with the ship. That's a zealot. That's Simon. So now you see the reference? He's sitting with Matthew, a tax collector for Rome. What would that conversation be like? I mean, Simon literally would hate what Matthew did and stood for. Granted, turned out so did Matthew. But that's that melting pot in this room. That's why this room could be full of such diverse backgrounds, because what we have in similarity, faith in Jesus Christ and a calling to serve Him and to love Him, to bring glory to God, so outweighs our differences. He was a zealot. Listen to this verse, Psalm 133. You know it. You probably know it to hear it. Psalm 133. How beautiful it is when the brethren dwell together in unity. Think of that with 12. All we know about Simon is a zealot. How did Jesus, his leadership and management skills must have been over the top to get these 12. I would love to have heard conversation down the dirt roads as they break up into their little groups. I'd love to hear what all they talk. And Jesus saying, okay, hey, John, I got to go back. Did you hear that? Yeah, we can't do that. He's got to make his way back again and go, guys, come on. Yeah, no, we're right. Yeah, you're right, Jesus. We're good. We're good. How beautiful it is when brethren dwell together in unity. That's really all we know about Simon. Then the next Judas, Judas Thaddeus. How would you like that for all eternity in heaven? You go, oh, you're Judas. The other one. Or, or they'd see you and go, Judas, you're here. The other one. <laughs> and then the next phrase would be, oh, there was another one? Because <laughs> we don't even remember there was another one. Like he's lost twice. That's why if you read the listings, they'll be referred to as Jude or Thaddeus. I'm just sick of being called Judas. I'm not that one. Judas, not that one. There's one story of his. You got to look at it. John 14. John 14. It's worth looking at because it's deep. You had Thomas ask questions, a little skepticism. He was a little bit, um, remember Thomas was the, unless I feel the scars, I'm not going to believe. Philip had some questions. This is Judas Thaddeus, Jude. This is that Judas's contribution to the word. 
it's, it's actually deep. John 14 is known, that's the passage, that's the I am the way, truth, and the life passage, but then this is Jesus promising the Holy Spirit, and it gets deep. Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. This is verse 18. I'm not going to leave you as orphans because he's leaving to go away to prepare a place. He goes, I'm going to come to you, yet a little while in the world will Uh, see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Okay, you can almost picture them, a little Scooby-Doo, like their heads are turned, and they're like, huh? Like, what? What is, literally their ears are perking. Like, uh, it's not, remember they're expecting, they were expecting Jesus to rule as king. Everyone would see it. Everyone would see he's the leader and the king. That's what they're expecting. So this is not sounding right. In verse 20, in that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Right here it is, verse 22. Judas, not Iscariot, the other one, This is it. This is his big line for all eternity. Judas said, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Do you see what he just did? He is just explaining what they were expecting. Wait a minute. If we're going to be this amazing, how is it that we see this and the world doesn't? Because when you're on the grand stage that you're the Messiah and you're going to lead every, how do we see it and they don't see it? Right? Remember the triumphal entry? They're making him as king. That's what they were expecting. So this didn't make sense to them. Judas, very humble question, very sincere. In fact, we would all say super grateful that he asked the question. There's no edge to it. Really is a good, humble question. Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he'll keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Go back again to his answer. If anyone loves me, He will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Ooh, this is different. Because the verses that led up to this was saying, I'm going to send the paraclete. That was the word he used. I'm going to send the helper, the one that comes alongside of you. I'm leaving, but I'm sending. It's the Holy Spirit. So he says, we are in you. This is, this is all new level. Old Testament, Holy Spirit came upon them for temporary seasons for particular tasks. That's what the Holy Spirit did. So the Holy Spirit would empower them to do something great, and then the Holy Spirit is gone. New Testament, all different. He goes, how, is, how are you going to make yourself manifest to us and the world can't see it? He goes, great question. If you know me and love me, you're going to keep the commandments, and we, it, he went plural on us, we are in you. Oh. This is, this is not something where they walked away and went, now we get it. They walked away and went, huh? Because it's totally different than what they were expecting. Judas, the other one, humble, elite follower among the twelve, clearly didn't understand everything but he faithfully served the Lord. That's what we know of him. There it is. It's, it's end of story. Now there is, a, was he martyred? Yeah, it did seem like he was. They all seem to be, most of them, but 
how in the circumstance, nobody knows. I notice that a lot of us look to that negative side. Here he is, elite 12, unknown, literally picked by Jesus to be a part of the 12, and he successfully carried it out, and we don't know anything about him. That's really quite remarkable. And I think it's quite similar to us. Here we are serving the Lord, and it's, you're preparing for a lesson, and nobody's clapping for you while you're cross-referencing and making sure that you've got things right. We may get your name wrong. That is awesome. <clears throat> Early on in ministry, <clears throat> excuse me, because we were at a large church, I was a staff member, we got all the time in the lot. I was there for 15 years as an associate pastor. And I'm not kidding. There wasn't a Sunday that went by. They were like, hey, Pastor Rod. And I'm like, hey. Hey, Pastor Ron. Okay, I'll take it. I mean, it was unbelievable. I'm like, how is this possible? It's because it doesn't matter. What matters, and it's the folk, what are we looking for? Are we looking for attention? Are we looking for self-serve, or are we looking to serve God? Head down, known, not known, doesn't matter. You know, that old, it was an old psychology test is where that, uh, the glass half empty, half full thing came from. It's an old psychology test where they take a glass and they fill it halfway and set it, and no comment, It was new to everybody, and they said, explain it. And based on their description, you could decide whether or not they're a pessimist or an optimist. It's half full or half empty, right? I mean, that's kind of what it would be. Or you're an engineer, and you say, well, I think the glass is too big. Whatever. I suppose there could be other options, but it's typically half empty or half full. I think of this a lot with your life, and I know that bad things have happened, and I am aware in many of your cases, so many I don't know, things didn't turn out the way you thought they would, you've been through some pain. Because of our faith in Jesus Christ and the relationship that we have with God, your glass is 97% full. As a believer, I know you've had tough things, and well, let's say it, maybe the toughest are yet to happen and you don't know it. Hate to break that to us all, right? Many of us remember where we were. I remember like it was yesterday, and it was was probably, oh, Grant was probably seven, so it was 2003. In my car, I know what road I was on when I get the phone call that Grant's eyes are permanently damaged. I'll never forget it. And you know where you were when you got that horrible phone call. And yeah, the world, they better be afraid because they have no idea what's going to happen in their life. You and I have a hundred percent certainty through faith in Jesus Christ that that which happens to us is best for you to the glory of God. You, can I get an amen on that? It, let's keep thinking and remembering that your glass is ninety-seven. That's probably that's probably offensive to God when I say ninety-seven percent. He's like, eh, it's higher than that. I mean. One in eight in the world today cannot have any access to clean water. You and I have it at our sink. Yeah, a little chlorine tasting. (laughs) Right? We have clean water. You look at the blessings that you and I have. It is. It's 97% full. Not taken away from any of our pain. So much of your pain, you can make me cry so fast by telling your story. I get that. And when we're done crying, and we acknowledge that we don't like the way it is, we can slowly stop and settle and say, yes, but Jesus loves me. 
He died for me. I have a relationship with God not based on anything that I do or think or say. Faith in Jesus, a relationship with God. Is that fantastic? So you can bear all the bad. Yeah, it also redefines the bad. Not just bear. Don't sound like the world. It's not just bear the bad. It redefines the bad. That which has happened to us is to the glory of God, and it's for your best. And I'll never understand why. You say I was abused as a kid. I will go to my grave saying I will never understand why that happened to you and how... I see zero good in it. I hate it as much as you do. But my faith in God says it happened for your best and to his glory. And I know that hurts. Well, you know how I know that? Because it was that horrible Friday when Jesus was crucified. It was literally the worst thing that's happened in the history of the world. God in flesh, crucified, abused, mocked, for claiming to be God of whom he was. And that night and the next day, those disciples, at this point, they were one down with Judas Iscariot. The 11 of them could not think of one possible good thing that could come out of that. Couldn't make it up. What could ever, that was the most horrendous experience of their life. Nothing good could ever come of that. And they were less than 24 hours away from the greatest thing to happen in the history of the world. Am I right? You and I live on that Saturday. I don't know why the family member's gone. I don't know why the job is gone. I don't know why the illness. It, none of it makes sense to me either. I, I don't get it. But God does. Let me look at this last one real quick. It's James the Less. It's Mark 15.40 if you want to see it. It's Mark 15.40, and you're only looking at one thing. Uh, Mark 15:40 is where we literally see the one word. It says there were women looking on from a distance. This is the death of Jesus, among whom Mary Magdalene and Mary, it's actually Mary of Clopas, the mother of James the Younger. The mother of James the Younger. It's translated James the Less. No one has any idea what that was. He literally could have just been smaller in stature. That's all. They had to differentiate. Which James are you talking about? We had the two greatest guys at our last church, both G-E-N-E, Gene, last name Miller. One was black, one was white. So the white one called himself uh, Gene Light, and with no offense, we'd, we'd, we'd say, oh, I talked to Gene Mill the other day. Which one? Black Gene. White Gene. They both said it. I mean, they both referred to it. They're like, oh, yeah, I've never met you before. Yeah, I'm, I'm the white one. That could literally be what's happening here. It's James the less. He's the smaller one. Could be the younger one. Could be younger. Younger, smaller. I don't think less accomplished. I don't think there was anything demeaning about it. But maybe his stature. I don't know. Maybe his influence. And that's all we have. I don't know. I don't know what it means. Elite 12, and that's all we've got. There was a story of a long time ago, literally telegraph. A woman sent a note to her husband overseas and said, I found a wonderful bracelet, price 75000 May I buy it? The husband couldn't respond quick enough and said, no, price is too high. She bought it because the message that she received didn't have a comma. No price is too high. 
That's actually, a, that's actually a true story. He sued the telegraph company and won because she did that. Uh, it, you know, I, your contribution may seem small to the kingdom. These 12 literally, the other Judas is gone. They didn't move until they replaced him back to 12, and those 12 built what we know as Christianity today, as followers of Jesus. That's pretty heavy. We don't know a thing about him. I think of that. You may drop $5 in an offering plate and say, oh, this is such a beautiful facility. They're doing great things. We support missionaries around the world. My $5 isn't much. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, it actually really is. Preparing for, we have a new fifth, sixth grade class starting up uh, in a couple weeks. That's a teacher, a helper. Uh, yeah, we need help, but it's not that big of a thing. No, it is a big thing. It's that comma. It's a big thing. J James the Less was a big thing. Everything that we do has great contribution to the kingdom. Let me end with this one thought, if I could. Um, it's a story by uh, the D. James, oh, we were talking to D. James Kennedy this morning too, weren't we? Uh, a PCA pastor for many years. Thanks for your guys' service. Uh, D. James used to tell a story, because it's actually his story, that a friend said, D. James Kennedy the, uh, from Coral Ridge in Florida, uh, a friend said, you need to come see my friend. I, I want you to meet this friend. And he goes, yeah, I agree. They approached this facility, which is for extremely severely challenged people. And they go into this room and their footsteps on the floor create enough rumble for the man that they're to see felt their movement coming in so the man in the bed started to stir a bit. Kennedy tells the story that this guy was crippled he had no hands but stumps. He was blind, deaf, and mute. And as the vibrations felt them going to the bed, and imagine who you have, one of my heroes, maybe yours too, D. James Kennedy, is an amazing man, started wonderful ministries. There he is walking into the room, a little legendary, not to this guy. They moved closer to the bed, and the man shuffled himself in order to lean on his partial arm and with a toothless grin, he held his other arm in the air and pointed to give the best testimony that he could to the God that saved him. A nobody to the world, but faithful. And when you and I stand before God someday and explain our lack of faithfulness to the small, important task that we have, and we have to explain ourselves, we want to pray that that guy's not standing next to us because he is faithful, well done good and faithful servant. We don't even know his name. We still don't. We tell the story and don't know his name. I don't know what your background is and the pain that you've been through. God loves you through faith in Jesus Christ. You have a relationship with him, and we stay faithful to the service of which he's called us to. The Bible says he's created good works for us to do. And we do that faithfully, whether they know my name or don't know my name, doesn't matter. Even among the 12, there's a couple that we know their first name, and that's it. But faithful with the cause of Christ, and truthfully, if not for their faithfulness, there's a good chance we wouldn't even be here today. So bow with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Thank you for saving us, and thank you for the faithfulness that you've been in our lives. would ask that your Holy Spirit would 
Keep us humbly walking before you and faithfully serving you. In Jesus' name, amen.